Hi guys, I'm uh, Pete Hanna, I'm a neurology resident. I was fortunate to do an opto, neuro, uh, neuro opto ophthalmology rotation last month. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a 28 year old woman with new onset vision loss. Her chief complaint was decreased vision. It was worse in the left eye. She also noted a light that she described in this eye. She's a 28 year old uh, right handed Hispanic woman. Um, she has a long standing history of bad eyesight, which was not significantly improved after a LASIK surgery in 2002. Uh, and she feels that her vision has been blurrier than usual for two months after a UTI. Two weeks prior to us seeing her in Neuro Opto Clinic, she was sitting at a computer doing desk work and she noticed a bright, a bright light in her left eye. This light was uh, present with her eyes open or closed. Um, she thought her vision got a little bit better initially about uh, for three to four days after this initially happened, but then it worsened. She denies any eye pain, headache, or tinnitus. And it's so bad she no, f she, she no longer feels comfortable driving. She had stopped driving for two weeks prior to seeing her. She feels her left eye used to be better, but now it's her right eye. So she went to an area vision center. She was 2400 OD and, uh, and OS without correction. Uh, she was 2150 in the right eye and 2200 with correction, which she felt was worse than her baseline. They did a Humphrey visual fields that showed this sort of sequocentral scotoma, and they described it as a unilateral optic disc elevation edema on their exam. They did an MRI, uh, interestingly, right off the bat, and this is a fat sat uh, T2, I believe, that shows on relatively normal nerves. It was read as a normal exam. So review of systems was significant for a 10 pound weight loss over the last five months. She denies any night sweats, fatigue, or musculoskeletal complaints. She's had significant depression and anxiety, which she related to a bad breakup with uh, her ex-husband. Um, she's had persistent dysphoria and flank pain and no rashes, otherwise a negative review of systems. She's had a long standing history of recurrent UTIs. She says she gets two to three per year. Um, the one two months prior she felt hadn't been properly treated, she still had flank pain and uh, dysuria. She had this LASIK procedure in 2002 in Mexico City. Her vision never improved. Otherwise, her past medical history is pretty uh, non-contributory. Social history, no tobacco or drug use, a very occasional alcohol use. Her husband um, was, uh, had multiple partners. He was sleeping around. She travels back and forth from Mexico. She had been uh, uh, there relatively recently, and she has no significant con uh, contact with pets, uh, specifically asking about cats. Physical exam, when we saw her visual acuity, uh, uh, again, was 20, uh, 2400, pinhole to 2100 in the right eye, and 2400 with no change in pinhole on the left eye. She had no um, relative afferent, afferent pupillary defect. And her visual fields, although intact in all four quadrants, she again noted some visual complaints. This is her anthrogrid. Uh, relating back to the sequocentral scotoma. Her extraocular mo motility was full. Uh, she had poor color vision in the left eye. Her stereopsis was uh, absent. Her anterior segments were clear and quiet, and her intraocular pressures were just 13 millimeters of mercury on the uh, uh, bilaterals. So on fundest exam, her right eye showed these uh, concerning retinal pigment changes. And then on her left eye, we saw this. So for residents and students, what do you see? Anybody? Normal or abnormal? Okay. <laughs> How's it abnormal? Right. So there's uh, some disc edema and there's uh, this macular with a star pattern uh, as to those. Angiography showed some leakage of contrast right around the optic um, nerve. However, the rest of the vasculature seemed um, mostly intact. And so she, ha she had optic disc edema with macular star or odems. So the differential neuroretinitis is uh, commonly associated with it, but there's also some other uh, conditions like hypersensitive retinopathy, papilledema with uh, usually severely increased intracranial pressure, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, diabetic papillopathy, uh, vitreous traction, disc and juxtapapillary tumors, and some toxic causes. So neuroretinitis, um, is typified by the swelling of the optic nerve along with these exudates in the retinal um, star pattern. So the reason that we see the exudates in that star pattern is um, they, uh, the lipoproteinaceous deposits settle out in Henle's layer, which is deep within the macula, and the nerve fibers run in sort of a radial pattern, so it settles out in that star uh, pattern that we see on a fundoscopic exam. 
So for neuroretinitis, there's numeral and numerous infectious etiologies. It's sort of an infectious <coughs> disease. You've got the exciting day at the beach. So there's bacteria, Bartonella hensley or scratch catch, cat scratch disease is one of the most common infectious causes. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, TB, salmonella. Toxoplasmosis is a protozoa that can uh, cause this. Several spirochetes, uh, significant syphilis, Lyme disease, and leptospirosis, multiple viri, measles, mumps, rubella, the three Vs, HSV, BZV, and CMV, hepatitis and coxsackie can cause it as well as dengue fever. Um, Toxicara canis, a nematode, has uh, been associated with it, and several fungi, including histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis, and actinomycosis. Uh, there was a case report where it was associated post-vaccination of a rabies vaccine where a patient got bilateral uh, neuroretinitis that they felt was uh, due to the vaccine. And several important non-infectious causes, including sarcoid, uh, um, irritable bowel disease, and periarteritis nervosa. So what about our patient? She denied any specific contact with cats. She was from Mexico and traveled back and forth. Her ex-husband slept around, exposing her to STDs. She had this history of recurrent UTI UTIs and still had urinary symptoms uh, and this recent 10 pound unintentional weight loss. And as she made sure we knew, she also had no insurance. So it's easy to run a battery of tests in situations like this. We can just open up the, the order menu and start ordering one after another. Um, she was very concerned about her finances. She had already paid out of pocket for an MRI uh, and uh, was asking us to be a little bit more specific about the test we chose. So our dilemma is what, what studies do we order? So we decided to go after potentially treatable causes and, and to look for the most common causes first. So she had this urinary tract infection. We wanted to do a UA and culture, that's low-hanging fruit. Um, HIV 1 and 2, secondary to a risk for STDs, that would just broaden our differential greatly. Uh, RPR for syphilis, Bartonella hensley for cat scratch disease, ACE levels for sarcoid. Um, we ordered a quantifier in gold versus the standard skin test because she had a history of BCG vaccination and then a chest x-ray that would help um, look for s both sarcoid and TB. So the results came back. Her, uh, she did have a urinary tract infection, but it was E. coli pan sensitive. She was negative for HIV 1 and 2. Her uh, RPR was negative. Toxo was negative. ACE levels were normal. Her Bartonella Hensley uh, antibodies were uh, within normal limits. Her quantifier in gold came back high. So Quantifier and TB Gold is an indirect test for the uh, mycobacterium tu tuberculosis complex organism. And basically, it, uh, it injects small peptides that are related specifically to these organisms and then quantifies the amount of interferon gamma levels. It's thought to be very uh, accurate even with prior uh, BCG vaccinations, and it's because the peptides they use are not, uh, don't cross react with the BCG vaccination. Um, and there was a recent system um, review. In uh, the British uh, Medical Bulletin, they looked back and sort of went through all the studies to uh, to see how well these quantifier tests work. They thought the sensitivity ranged from 64 to 93 percent, and the specificity ranged from 89 to 100 percent. So it's a fairly effective test. So TB neuro neuroretinitis, TB is well recognized as an ocular pathogen, but it's more typically associated with neuritis um, when talking about the nerves. And when it's an optic neuritis, it's usually a complication of a systemic infection, often associated with meningitis. Um, specifically for t TB neuroretinitis, there's a couple of cases described in association with a large peripapillary choroidal lesion. It's much less common to have it just an isolated case of neuroretinitis. Um, so Schulte and his colleagues in 1999 described a case of a 43-year-old Mexican uh, immigrant who had an isolated neuroretinitis with macular scarring and a positive CPD in a setting of otherwise normal studies and exams. So it sounded somewhat similar to our patient. This is their black and white uh, version of the fundoscope um, imaging. There's a, a clearly uh, edematous disc, but then it's a little bit harder to see the scarring. You can see some exudate there around the macula. And on the right is her PPD, which is greater than 15 millimeters. So in this particular patient, treatment with uh, isoniazide and rifampin re resulted in prompt resolution of her choroidal infiltrate. She also had an exudative retinal detachment that flattened and uh, vision improved. So what was our plan? These aren't our ID doctors, but we decided to talk to ID doctors. Sorry. <laughs> um, these are from UCLA. And they felt that um, 
we should repeat the TB, the uh, clonopure and gold. And I think the reasoning, looking through the literature, although it's a sensitive and specific test, it does have problems when it's not handled properly and can be less sensitive and specific. So they want it repeated. Um, this patient will also get ophthalmology, neuro-ophthalmology, and neuro-ophthalmology follow-up. I'm not sure why those pictures look different. So in conclusion, uh, in the setting of painless vision loss, it's always in, uh, in very important to pay close attention to macular findings, and this is something that I'll take to my neurology colleagues because we're sort of fixated on the nerve. Um, the differential of neuroretinitis is very broad and can entail an extensive workup. Should always consider the cost of studies with or without insurance, but specifically if a patient is uninsured. And then just take a more um, purposeful course in, in how to rule out what's going on. And we decided the treatable causes first. Um, in, cases, in a case study of isolated TB retinitis, treatment of the underlying condition uh, resulted in improvement of her vision and uh, ocular findings. With this patient, we're actually having some problem with follow-up, and that brings up a whole other issue because now, now what do we do next? We have to get the health Department of Health involved in that. Yeah. treatment for TB don't you And if this is what's going on and it's similar to the previous case study, she'll get her, she'll get her vision back quickly. Thank you guys very much.